May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to thee, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. As I think back to my growing up to my early years, I realized I didn't know a thing about Jesus or God. So what motivated me to, to follow, to say I want to join the church? Well, I got to tell you, I like the idea of what Jesus could do for me. You know, some people still hold to this gimme, gimme theology. You know, believe it and you'll be rich. Believe and you'll be prosper. Name it and claim it. An understanding of God as a cosmic Santa Claus. You're good, you become saved, and God will provide. You know, like the Janice Joplin song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me? <laughs> My friends all have portions. I must make the men. Oh Lord, won't you buy me? Jesus are afflicted. 
They are living under a new pharaoh, and they're, they're poor people. These are people whose lives are marked, marked by everything they do not have. And here's this person who has just fed the multitudes, who they see as someone who can provide for their most basic needs. But here Jesus says, don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Work for the food that sticks with you, food that nourishes your lasting life. <clears throat> here Jesus is trying to, to disrupt the social effects of a materialistic driven world. You know the story that we all grew up, that we learned about King Midas, who was granted his wish. His desire was to be wealthy. He wanted to be so wealthy that everything he touched would turn to gold. And his wish is fulfilled. And at first it's wonderful. He can touch a branch, it turns into gold. He can touch a pot, it turns into gold. But then when he touches his food, when he touches those people who he loves, they too are turned into gold. And his ultimate need to be nourished, to be sustained, cannot be satisfied. His need for great wealth, for that material manifestation, leaves him unsatisfied. And so here, Jesus corrects this longing for a material manifestation, then it's going to be all right, that you're going to have enough. By encouraging them to look to be nourished, to be enriched, to be energized in ways that are more sustaining than money or power or even food. And the crowd responds, hey Jesus, how do we get some of that God stuff? It's clear that the crowd is still thinking about a physical manifestation of abundance. Something that satisfies that you don't have to make a purchase. Sir, give us this bread. Sign us up. And Jesus says, throw your lot in with the one that God has sent. That kind of a commitment gets you in on God's good works. The Living Bible translation puts it this way. They replied, what should we do to satisfy God? And Jesus told them, this is the will of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. <laughs> and the people said, you know what, you need to show us some more miracles. If you want us to believe that you were the Messiah. Why don't you just give us some free bread every day, like our fathers had when they journeyed through the wilderness. As the scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven. Again, Jesus tells them, don't worry about that bread. Even that bread got moldy and rotted away. If you recall, that's exactly what happened. Because in the Exodus, the people were so fearful, so convinced that they would not have enough that once they received God's nourishment, they received all they needed for each day. Give us this day our daily bread. The people believing that there cannot be enough food, there cannot be enough water, there cannot be enough jobs, there cannot be enough opportunity for all believing more in scarcity than abundance. They responded by hoarding the bread. But Jesus understands their need and their misdirection and insists they are to labor for the bread that doesn't perish. Now the people get all theological on Jesus and remind them that if you're supposed to be the Messiah, can't you even do what Moses did? Give us some bread from heaven. But Jesus corrects them and says, that wasn't Moses. But isn't that just like us? 
wanting to lift up personality over divine purpose. Confusing the gift that comes through someone rather than acknowledging the source of the gift. Moses didn't do any of that on his own. Jesus tells them that was God's bread. And then they're still puzzled, and then they respond, well, sir, just give us the bread. Always. Just give it to us. The truth is, there are a lot of reasons why people see the crowd that we read about this morning sought him out for material reasons. I mean, if he's the Messiah, he needs to show us some powerful stuff. He needs to give us something we can use. Don't think badly about those people because haven't there been times when we've thought the same thing? Sure. And that in itself isn't wrong, but it is wrong when we want to use Jesus like some genie in a bottle or like some prayer slot machine. It's easy to understand why we need a tangible something. Because that invisible God thing can be hard to wrap your mind around. I mean, faith without any props can feel incredibly uncertain. That's why we tend to put our faith in other things that we can see and touch, that we can experience directly, things like our career, things like our finances, family, relationships, and our own ability to control our lives. It's no wonder that most of us prefer to place our belief, our faith, in something concrete, jobs, our homes, our finances, our symbols of belonging and status, even a free meal. But unfortunately, life has a way of reminding us that faith in those things may not be as fulfilling as we expect. We lose our jobs, we lose our money, status is gained, status is lost, family and friends will let you down, and often we really don't have the control we thought we had. Most of these things are the perishable things that Jesus talks about in our gospel lesson for today. All those seemingly reliable things in our life, they let us down. And we really shouldn't be surprised about that. Because those perishable things that we put so much of our faith in simply lack the ability to satisfy our deepest need. A life that is directed towards love and liberation, forgiveness, grace, and justice. So if you want something to feed you, if you want something to fill you up, if you want something to provide the energy you need to fight the powers and principalities of darkness and high places, if you want something to nourish you at all times, Jesus answers, I am the bread of life. This passage calls us to broaden our understanding of the significance of Jesus. <coughs> Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, born to a woman of questionable morals, Jesus who was a felon, who hung out with outcasts, who was considered a threat to the government, who the religious authorities felt was too radical because he was healing without consent of the government. He didn't go around promoting their health plan. Who was <laughs> recognizing women, who was giving voice to a vision of community that included everyone and who was tortured and murdered. Here, Jesus gives some awesome significance to his radicalism, all because he believed himself to be 
so much an agent of divine love and understanding that we, in order to embrace all that he was, need to internalize his spirit. And here he gives us a symbol, bread, something tangible to bridge us to the intangible. So Jesus, by taking a common substance, like bread, and giving secret significance to it, to a people hungry for justice, hungry for equality, hungry for just a fair break, it becomes for us not just bread, but something that will feed our deepest hungers of belonging, or needing healing, or needing to be forgiven. And Jesus becomes something that will feed our hearts and souls as we yearn for a better world, as we yearn for justice. Something that will feed our imaginations of how we can really live without hoarding resources or fighting over them. Here Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And that bread is what is being offered today in your communion. And in our prayers we ask, Lord, send your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine which we receive so that they can become for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may feed on hope, feed on love, so that we may feed on courage, so that we may feed on clarity of purpose, so that we may feed on new possibilities and internalize the hope. We feed on that bread so that we may internalize that God-given vision so that we may internalize that deep and abiding love. Which is why we say, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart 